listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you people something that, you know, well, you know, I'm getting married in September. And when we when we were picking out, I didn't want to get married in a church, but Joanne wanted to. So she wanted to pick out a church. She's Catholic, but we can't get married because I'm divorced and you can't get married in a Catholic church. So we picked a Lutheran church because it's close to Catholic. And now, given we've been together for eight years, one and a half years of that, I was bi-coastal. Then she moved to L.A., then we moved back to New Jersey. So that's like 20 years in relationship time. Well, we had to take a compatibility test. And it's so funny, and we had to go in and talk to the pastor, and we aced the test. But now we have to go back tomorrow and one more time to, I don't know why, and we had to do homework. So I'm saying if you plan to get married, get married by someone you hire, an official. And I would have done that, but we couldn't. Anyway, got that off my chest, so I have an interesting weekend. Anyway, we have a great show today. My my guest uh, just came out, recently came out with a new album. He, uh, and I, that's right, I call them albums. He sang one of the biggest songs of the 90s, a huge hit. And he's a great guy. And my guest is James Atkin. How you doing, James? Yeah, I'm good, Steve. How are you? I'm hanging in there. You know, it's good. We, I'm, we People, we had a little problem calling because... My Skype, I had set for a unknown, so his phone, like a smart man, he has his phone set not to get unknown numbers, but we figure it out. So, how's your day going today, James? Yes, it's very good, Steve. You know, when you were talking earlier, I thought, that, I thought you were just about to say that unbelievable was going to be your wedding dance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the thing is... Well, you know, it's funny. Is I, I know the DJ, and now that will be on the that, because of this interview, that will be on the wedding list. It won't be our dance song, but that will be on the wedding list. So I'm going to talk to him later today. I'm going to say you got to put "Unbelievable" on it. Yes, I'm actually. Are you are you based in Philadelphia? Uh, yeah, ten minutes outside Philadelphia. All right, because I'm actually in Philadelphia in August, so you never know if you want me to come along and sing it to your life. That sucks because our our wedding our wedding is September 13th. Yeah. That would have been great. That would have been something people would have been like, holy shit, Steve really does know people. <laughs> so you, you've been in music for a long time. Uh, what piqued your interest? At what point did you start getting interested in music? And what bands were you listening to? Because we're around the same age. And there was such a great sound movement back in the day. I had a roommate from college who was from Hong Kong. And he brought over... New Order and all these bands we never really listened to in the States. What was your first introduction to music? And then who did you start listening to as your teen years started going um, through? Well, if we go right back, I guess my parents, my dad was a folk musician and my mom was a singer in a choir. Um, my grandparents gave me rock and roll records from the 50s, which I used to listen to religiously. Um, and that kind of planted the seed, I guess. And then it was... Um, when I got into school and we started listening to bands like The Jam, and you mentioned New Order, which we adored, um, and that kind of kick-started us off with the, with the passion. Now, when did you start playing music or getting into music, What what and what made you do that? Um, well, I got my first guitar, my first electric guitar when I was 11 years old. Um, I couldn't play it, but I just loved holding it and posing in front of the mirror. Um, slowly, and very slowly, I got to learn the instrument. And then when we got to secondary school, so I would have been aged 11 or 12 by this point, we put school bands together. And there was like-minded people in my school who did end up being in a band called EMF afterwards, but this is going way back. And we just used to rehearse in local barns, village halls, uh, anywhere we could find a little bit of space to set up our guitars, our drums, and our PA, and we would just play. Um, so it was years in the making, you know, for, for a good five, six, seven years, we did sound atrocious, but it didn't really stop us. Well, now, you were you were brought up in Gloucester? Yeah, I did. Um, well, I was actually born in Birmingham, which is in the middle of the, uh, the UK, and then I moved to the West Country, Gloucester, uh, when I did my secondary school, yeah. Now, how was there? How was the music scene around there? I mean, was there places playing live music, and did you know that you could probably somehow get into that scene? Yeah, well, this was the mid eighties, um, and it was all about live music. It was kind of before the dawn of DJs and radio. 
Fife and clubs. There were clubs, but they were very cheesy clubs playing dodgy sort of commercial disco music. But it was all about going out on the weekends, going to bars, clubs, and watching live bands. And there was a, there was a real mixture of bands. It was kind of you'd have your funk bands, your soul bands, your punk bands, your electronic bands. It was a real mishmash. Um, so there was a, yeah, there was a real rich rich culture of live music going on. Now, how did you want to, did you, at that point, did you know you wanted to be in that scene? Um, yes, right from the beginning. I, I always, I always wanted to be a pop star. <laughs> um, and my mom did say, God help us if he doesn't become a pop star, because that, that was the only thing I had in mind as far as a career. <laughs> so things did work out quite well, actually. <laughs> now, so, so how do you start to attain that goal? Do you have it? I know. I think you was you. Were, I read something that said before EMF formed, you you and the other people were known somewhat in the music community. Well, certainly locally we were because it was we, where we came from was quite a small community anyway, and everybody played in each other's bands at different times, so everybody kind of knew each other. Um, lots of hard work kind of got us into it and noticed. It certainly wasn't instant. And also, I think a lot of luck played into it as well. Right time, right place, right sound, right look. Everything kind of kind of just fell together when we did EMF. Now, how did you form EMF? How did the whole uh, how did it begin? Well, it was it started as a school band. Uh, we weren't called EMF at the time, uh, but it had me. Derry, who was the keyboard player, and Zach, who was the bass player, um, and we used to have rehearsals, but at rehearsals we didn't really used to play our instruments, we used to just uh, usually just mess around, jump up and down on the couch, put fancy dress clothes on, um, drink cider, there wasn't a great deal going on, but then we thought, well, let's get serious about this, so we had a friend who lived in the city up the road, which was Gloucester, called Ian, who was a super talented. Um, he'd already been in a band that was, I wouldn't say established, but certainly more up and coming than what we were. Um, so he came along one weekend, he spent a wild weekend with us. He really liked our vibe and our energy, although at this point we had no songs. Um, so he wrote a few songs and we got together, we did some rehearsals, and then we got a fantastic drummer called Mark to come along, who was just an old school friend who I'd been in bands with for many years. He joined and that was the five members that went on to become EMF for the rest of history. Now, how is it decided that you were singer? Were you always the singer, or how did that work? No, I mean, I have sung in previous bands, but when we started, I wanted to be the guitarist. Um, so there was, there, was a, there was a legendary rehearsal in a Gloucester rehearsal studio where I had a guitar. I think Derry was on the guitar, Zach was on the guitar, and Ian was on the guitar. Um, <laughs> and then we thought, well, this isn't really going to work, so we kind of... Divided, our, divided it up a little bit, so Zach went onto the bass, um, I dropped the guitar, went onto vocals, Ian had to play the guitar because he's a genius guitar player, and I think Derry was kind of, Derry was always kind of forward thinking with the electronic side, so he got into keyboards and sampling, um, So, but it, it kind of worked out great later on in our career because we could swap instruments quite a bit, we were kind of tied down to our instruments, um, but I am kind of glad that I became singer it's kind of quite a good job quite a good role in the band now how did you come up with the name emf because you said what was your what was um, your previous what was your previous name before emf um we were called well we there was a band with me mark the drummer um and that was called faces of glory <laughs> which was a quite a good name <laughs> um we had lots of different names we used to have a rehearsal unit that someone owned or it was a factory unit and it was unit 12 and I think we called ourselves unit 12 for a little while they were all like kind of kids names for bands you know school names for bands um, but the name EMF came along Derry came up with that um, it was the initials of a famous quote by a British journalist when he was actually talking about a new order gig and he called their fans Epsom Mad Funkers and we thought Epsom Mad Funkers EMF well we'll have that. 
and it's stuck, it's very catchy, which is cool, because, you know, it's just one of those names that you don't remember, I mean, you don't forget it, like, some names, you're like, oh, it's long, you're like, eh, but this, you're just like, BMF. Oh. Yeah, there's nothing clever about the name, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hindsight, we probably should have put some more thought into it, but, you know, a name, a name just becomes a name after a while, doesn't it? Like, you know, Oasis isn't a great name, is it? But you kind of don't think about the name, you just think about the band, don't you? So, exactly. Yeah. Now, how did you guys end up getting your first record deal? Because, you know, off of that record, you had the one of the biggest hits of the 90s. How did it come about for you to get that deal? Um, well, we'd been rehearsing. We'd wrote 10 songs. We booked a gig in our local pub. Um, the pub held uh, 50 people officially, but we invited a lot of friends down, and we had a couple of hundred people in there. Um, and then we thought, oh, we'll do another gig like that. And then by this point, I think, I'm not quite sure how, but there was a little bit of label interest um, from the big London record labels. Um, and they wanted us to go to London to do a showcase. And we said, mm, nah, we don't really want to do that. If, you, if you're really keen and you want to come check our band out, come to Gloucestershire. It was a place called the Forest of Dean. It was a little pub. Um, and we had a few label A&R people come down to the middle of nowhere and come and watch us. And they kind of, kind of saw what we were about and our vibe in our own territory. Um, and then we got offered record deals. Um, we had to... We were kind of smoothed a little bit by record labels, taken out for posh meals and stuff like that. And then we, we just had to choose one. And we um, we chose the e EMI in the end. Now, you get, now, do you go straight into the studio and start recording? Yeah, straight away. So um, the first 10 songs that we wrote, we went into a studio and we did a, a quick demo of them. Um, by this point, we got a manager and we started touring, um, not glamorous touring, it's like, you know, in the back of a back of a beat-up van, playing in, uh, staying in B&Bs. Um, so whilst we were on the road, we were kind of taking a couple of days out to go and demo the, the, the songs. Uh, and then we, when we finished our first little tour, we went in with some record label money backing, and then we just recorded the songs. Now, Unbelievable became the big hit on that. Uh, that was your that was your first single, right? It was our first single, yeah. Now, did it immediately take off, or did it take a little while to build momentum? Um, that's a good question, actually, because I don't... I didn't really notice at the time. I think it happened really quick um, compared to how records... Yeah, I don't know, actually. I mean, it seemed to just get released, it had some really good marketing from the record label, we were already out playing, we'd had a good reputation for being a good live band, um, we had an amazing record label behind us who pushed it, and it kind of happened really quick, and as soon as we got like the first TV, couple of TV appearances out of the way, we seemed to be in demand, um, and I think we did an appearance, there was a show called Top of the Pops in the UK, which was a... It was the one that everybody watched. This is going back to the days in the UK when you had free TV channels. Um, there was a show, Top of the Pops, on a Thursday night, and it was watched by millions. And I think we played that when we were kind of in the top 40. And then the following week, we just went sky high in the charts. Now, how did Dice Clay end up on your song? Well, again... Jerry was really good at sourcing samples. Um, so we found an amazing tape of um, Andrew Dice Clay doing a, a stand-up set, and that's where the famous, oh, um, what the fuck, and all that come from. Um, and we, were, we put it on the record, and then we hadn't really cleared the, cleared it, the sample with him. And then just by chance, and this is one of the weirdest things ever, we were in America staying at the higher this was when we were going up to just see some record labels. We'd never had anything released in America. And we saw him walking across a parking lot, going into the comedy store. Right. And I think Ian ran, ran over to him and said, oh, look, we're a band from the UK. We've got this song coming out. We've got your voice on there. Can we use your use user sample? And he was just like, yeah, guys, just do it. And I think he was like a death jam at the time. I might have imagined that. Oh, one second, I'm just doing it here. Oh, is it a parcel? Well, I'm sorry, are you all right for a second? I've just got to find a parcel. Okay. Stephen, one second. One second. Right, how's that? Okay, you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. Sorry, sorry about that. I hope that didn't mess it up for you. Oh, 
Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you can do some editing, can't you? Yeah, I can. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Andrew Dodge Clay, he, um, he says, yeah, guys, just go, uh, go ahead and use it. Um, and I guess he didn't realise what a big sample it would be, and it was everywhere. And I have heard since that he uses it, or he did use it to come on stage to and things like that. So, you know... I, I okay. guess for I guess for him though it also gave some awareness that people didn't know who Dice was because Dice was so big in America but I don't know if he was big across seas and when they hear that they probably thought oh where is this coming from yeah totally I mean I uh, hope he's done his career some good in 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 Europe as well but uh, yeah it's uh, it works both of us so now the the song starts the song rockets it, it hits it big in America you know mm. everyone was watching videos back then. How did it start changing your life? Because people must have recognized you, and you said you guys, when you came over to America the first time, it was your first time here. But now, did you translate to a tour in America, or what happened? Yeah, we did. I mean, once it got, once Unbelievable got released in America, and it, it went high on the billboard, we were touring, and we were actually touring over there. Everything, everything time-wise was fitting in really well. We were actually out there whilst the record was building. Um, I mean, getting to America was quite a, a, a crazy thing for us. It was very much, we had a tour bus, we'd do six week stints at a time. We'd go to city, a new different city every day. And when we turned up at the city, we'd have to go to Tower Records or a record store, do a sign in. And then we'd do like an afternoon of press. Then we'd do the gig. And then we'd have to do an after show meet and greet. So we really had to work it. Um, which was great. I mean, we were, we, you know, we were just in our 20s, just turned 20, early 20s. Um, a couple of members of, of the band were, he couldn't even drink in America, which we thought was really funny. Um, <laughs> didn't really fit in with our pop, but our rock and roll lifestyles. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, as we were there, I, I had a postcard that I was trying to send to my mom, and I said, our oh, mom, we're like, we're number 70 in the billboard, and then I crossed it out. But I, I kept crossing out, oh, no, we're 36 now, we're 14. Oh, and then by the time I got to post it a couple of weeks later, we'd hit the number one. So <laughs> it was quite a crazy thing. And it was great being actually in America when, when the success happened over there. Now, as you were getting this, as the song hits number one, it's getting bigger. Do you see your crowds getting bigger? Yes, definitely. I mean, we started off small, two, three hundred. By the end of the six weeks, we were canceling the venues and put it into bigger venues. Um, and I think at the end of one of them, it was LA, some amphitheater. Um, I can't remember what it was. It was, it was like four or five thousand in LA. So it was, it had grown. And then I think the second time we come after the, the big success, we did a few of the, are they, what would they be? Indoor arenas that hold 15,000 or something. So, I mean, that was kind of the peak of it. Um, it certainly didn't stay at that. But, uh, you know, it, the crowds did get big. Now, so so the, the album has success. The single goes in number one in the States. Do you, Are you thinking in your mind, what are we going to record next? Because, you know, number one, you can't go higher than number one. I know, and this was kind of always the big deal with EMF. We kind of, the, the, the successful peak was right at the beginning. Uh, I mean, the band only lasted for about four or five years anyway. Um, the good thing we did take away when we were doing the second album is obviously financially and we had a bit of credibility we thought we could do what we want but the band was playing really well because you know over those over the year we'd done you know 250 gigs or something so the band was on fire so what we did we kind of just set up for the second album we set up in a rehearsal room and wrote an album as a band um, with everybody playing and we were kind of totally devoted to it and that, that really shows in the second album it hasn't really got the, the commercial hits of the first album but it's it's the one I'm most proud of and it's the one I think people always refer back to but if people are into EMF and not just the song Unbelievable well, it didn't. It did. It didn't chart in the U.S., but it did chart in U.K. Now, are, did you start? You know, did you start getting worried as a band? I know you guys didn't last that long. Did, did the not charting lead to a breakup, or was that the next album that led to the breakup? Um, it was the third album that kind of led to that. We spent. We kind of. We had to have a real rethink because we've done a, a 
commercial pop album and then the second album was more of a rocky, indie, darker album which didn't have the success. So on the third album we were a little bit torn between what do we do. I mean, we loved the second album, that you know, that was the direction we were really into, but then record labels, pressure, you know, people said, Well, you know, you just want to hit wonders, you're failing now. So we did try to bring some more pop into it and I think we changed as people as well people were drifting apart there wasn't the bond in the band anymore because you know people get older and it's um, so the third album was a struggle and certainly after it kind of it got released it didn't do very well we lost funding for the record label um, and at the end of the day it's kind of a business and if you're not getting funds or paid or you know it's quite a, expensive to keep a band going <laughs> um, so it did just fall, fall to bits in the end so now you fall apart what are you going to do now i mean your you, music's in you you've had a number one hit what is your goal to do at this point in your life because you're still a young man well yeah i was and it was a, it was a tricky time it wasn't the greatest time of my life because it was um you know just a little bit lost really i mean I had, I was living off the fruits of the success financially and, you know, stuff and that kind of kept me going for like 10 years of just kicking back and it's a strange one because I always wanted to be a pop star and then I became a pop star and then it's like, well, what do you do now? And it was a time of going out, partying, maybe drinking too much, uh, not really much focus. I still, I, I, was, I was really passionate about dance music, so I loved going out raving, <laughs> but I loved making dance music as well, so it was quite nice in those 10 years just to sort of hone my skills in the studio and release the odd dance record. Um, there was little bits going on, I wasn't completely just sat on the couch drunk, I was doing bits. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, how did uh, Bentley Rhythm Ace come about? Well, Richard and Mike who are the two main people, they made this fantastic album um, and it got signed to Skint Records, which is a real prestigious record label in England. Um, and I was really good friends with Richard anyway, with two of America, because he was in a bank of Bob Leeds itself. Um, he came, we always used to hang out, but he came around the flat saying, oh look, we've got, we've got this gig up the road at the local university, what's going on, what should we do? And I said, well, come on, let's just go and do it, we'll stop, we'll put something together. So I think we got a shopping trolley with some bongos in it and some, I think I went and hired some white overalls that we painted up. Um, so the, the whole ethos was but from Bentley with Mace from the start was just like, come on, let's just have some fun. Let's get some wigs on. You know, we kind of, <laughs> you know, you know, this is this probably ain't going to last. Um, so I did, so we, we started playing, so I started playing live with Bentley with Mace and it came into my life just at the right time, really. So from being a, a singer in a band and having to work really hard to being in a band where I could just play the keyboards, some crazy sounds or some vintage synths and, you know, party and then go away every weekend and do every festival around Europe, go to South America again, Japan again, uh, Australia again and things like this. So it was, it was kind of a dream come true, really. It was like no pressure with your best friends and um, just going off and doing that. Fun. Now, it was probably, because you said the festivals and stuff, it was probably a different crowd than what you're used to. I'm sure all crowds translate. But did you see a difference between you were, when you were playing live, let's say, in America with EMF, and then playing oh. in Europe with Bentley Rhythm Ace at a festival? What was the difference in crowds, or is it just universal? I think it's pretty universal, really. I mean, it was certainly with Bentley Rhythm Ace, it's a lot more dance-driven. Um, so when we were playing... When we were playing festivals in Europe, they were usually one, two in the morning with lots of people partying very hard. Um, great atmosphere. Not so much a different type of geek crowd, I guess, but, you know, people are people, aren't they? And, um, yeah, I kind of, I've never really thought about that question, really. But, uh, you know, I kind of, it all, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. I, I mean, I loved playing in America as well. I thought American crowds were brilliant. Um, I never got to play any big festivals in America, though. I wish I had. Now, how long are we with Bentley Rhythm Ace, and do you still go out with them? Yeah, I mean, Bentley Rhythm Ace has been continuous for the last 20 years, so we still go out. I think the last... We kind of, we're kind of, we're kind of quite selective about what we do. We only do interesting things that we think are going to be fun. Uh, it's not like we are actively trying to go and get 
shows or anything. Uh, the last one we did was on a ferry over to Amsterdam where we played across the North Sea. Things like that. Things that are a little bit different. Um, but yeah, that's the last one. I, I, I still occasionally do EMS gigs as well. They, um, they crop up every now and again and it's the same kind of ethos. It it's looked interesting. Uh, like the, we've got an EMS show in Ireland in a couple of months um, and that's playing with the Tipperary, Tipperary um, an orchestra, playing with an orchestra on stage. So, if it, you know, things that look interesting and a bit like, oh, let's have a go at that. Well, EMF had gotten back together a few times. Now, yeah. And so what was it like getting back together? Was it just, was it a reason that, you know, because you guys missed each other? Or was it a reason that you just, you knew there was, it was just fun performing? Or why did you get back? Because you got back together a few times. What what caused that? Well, I think it's just really hard to leave it behind. I mean, EMF has been such a big thing in my life. It's, you know, if an opportunity comes up for us to go on stage and play our songs and show off a little bit, we'll, 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 we'll do it. And I think we'll carry on doing it. I think, you know, it's, everyone seems to do it. So I don't know all, all the bands these days. It's like, like I say, it's not like we're going out all the time and playing all the time. It's just, you know, odd things every now and again. But it's, yeah, I think it's just in our blood. It's in our DNA. We just, we just have to do it. Now, when do you decide you're going to record your solo album because you recorded three solo albums. One recently came out. And uh, yep. what was the path to you going solo because you had, you know, you had two different careers. You had Bentley and then you had EMF and they're two completely different ones. As a person, as a solo artist, were you, on your first uh, album, were you planning to mesh them or what was your, what was your goals of that first album? Um, I think... It probably ties more into EMS and Bentley Rhythmos because, to be honest with you, it was Richard and Mike who did all the music for the Bentley Rhythmos, so I didn't really have much cre uh, musical creativity involved in that. But, but when I've done my solo stuff, it's, I kind of, it's, it's again, I think I don't think I can leave it alone. I, I get so much out of being creative. I moved, I moved to a really quiet spot in the UK in the Yorkshire Dales, and it's very isolated. Um, and I've just got a little home studio set up. I don't really see many people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I just started writing some songs. I mean, I didn't plan to do a solo album, the first one. It was just sort of organically grew. I, you know, got a bunch of songs together. Haven't played them to anyone. I think I played them to the wife. Um, and then I thought, right, well, let's... In these days, you can just release solo albums and you can do it all on your own. And without the expectations or needing big funds for marketing. I, could, I thought, well, let's just put some music back out there and see what happens. And it, it's kind of grown from there. Now, what was your writing process? Because I know the first one, the Country Mile, has, I think, 15 songs on it. And to me, that's a lot of songs, cause especially now, you know, people, you know, I talk to people a lot about this. People don't, they buy a song. You know, people go, they don't, they don't appreciate the album like us old schoolers do. <laughs> What was I mean, yeah. what was your writing process for that first first album? Um, for the first album, I guess it was the songs can start from anywhere really. I I do really like dance music, so they might start from grooves and beats, uh, and then I'll start exploring melody and harmony and lyrics. Um, but it could be anything. It could just start with a little bit of a, a, a vocal phrase and then build a song around that. I'm not. I haven't really got a formula that I use all the time. Um, or maybe I haven't found the formula yet. I don't know. Maybe I'm still searching. Um, but I've got like a just a little bit of a studio set up. Nothing flash. And I just sit in there and just explore and experiment until I get things I like. Now, when you finished the Country Mile, were you happy with it? Did you sit there and go, because it's got to be a big thing to take on a on a uh, solo album. I mean, it is, now this was 2014. Music has changed. Everything's different. Was it, were you happy with your first release? I mean, or did you think, my next one, I'll do better? Uh, I always think I can do better. And as soon as, uh, I did, my favorite bit is the process of doing it. So I, I kind of lose interest at the point where it's been released. I would not lose interest, but I'm just like, right, let's move on to the next thing. Right, what can I learn from this? On reflection, what can I do better? And, and I think, certainly song-wise, on the first 
now, but I think my songwriting has developed a little bit. I kind of understand hooks and being catchy and simplifying things a little bit. Um, it's it's always a learning process. Now, you said you recorded it at your home studio. Do you um, do you play everything on it? I did, yeah, yeah, and it's um, it's program drums. Um, I did have a friend called Vladimir, who was a Russian producer, who took a couple of the tracks and worked some magic on there. But um, predominantly, it's produced by me. I produced, written, and recorded, and everything's done by me. Now, that must be weird just because you're doing everything and you have to decide what goes here and what goes there. So I guess it's a very personal experience when you record your own album and you play all the all the music. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it can be a little bit hard, but sometimes it's nice because you haven't got any outside influences. Um, you, you kind of just got to trust your own judgment a little bit. Like I said, I, get, I do get my wife who is a musician to come in and she might do some backing vocals but she'll have a listen and, she, and she's really good she's so much more into music than me and she'll uh, she listens to so much more music and she'll say well how about this uh, but other than that it's a very solitary affair but I kind of like it that way sometimes it's hard to, do, to, to work with people you know now now how how was it accepted did critics like it And I was really shocked that people were really digging it, which was which was great. But then again, you know, I kind of I realised deep inside, I kind of got past the point where I thought I'm not going to sell a million records again. I'm not, you know, this I'm not doing it for financial gain. Which good to get that out of the way, you know what I mean? And, and it's just so um, yeah, it was it was received well. So you finish it; it's received well. At that moment, when you you know you found it was received well, did you start planning for your next album? Did you sit there and and or were you sitting there going, "I'm gonna chill for a little yeah, bit, then yeah. I'll work on it." Yeah, I mean, I did I did leave it um, a little while and then just thought I'd a little bit recap how I wanted to do things. Um, I decided the first album I actually got someone to I recorded it and then I got someone to mix it for me and then the, the, which was great but then the second album I thought right I, I want to do this completely on my own this time I want to produce it and mix it from start to finish um, so that was that was fun although another steep learning curve and listening back to the that, that album The Party Faithful the production I, I feel like I could have I, I, I listen back to it and I go, well, maybe sonically I should have worked on that a little bit harder. Um, so, again, another learning process. Now, is it hard for you to listen to, I mean, you've you, you been listening to it, working it, and mixing it. Is it hard for you to sit down and listen to the final product because you've already been through the building up, you already, it's not like when we see a movie and we're sitting there and we watch and we don't know, we don't know, we see the end and we go, oh, you already know the final process, you already know the final product because you've worked on it. How do you yeah, feel when you, you listen to it? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't make a habit of sitting there and listening to my own records all the time, but I, I do, it's really hard, you kind of, I can't be subjective about it, I can't detach myself from it and like, you know, someone else listening to it for the first time, so, which is really hard and you need to kind of get around that a little bit because it's the same, you know, if you hear a, a tap dripping all night, eventually you won't hear it, you know what I mean? It's kind of just, you've got to be very, very careful, so I'm, I am quite conscious of that. Um, but I always, I do get excited about people listening to my music and it, it is great that it's getting out and people are hearing it. Now, is there a difference in your eyes of the musical style in your first two albums? Um, slightly, yeah. I mean, the thing that underpins it all is my vocals, really, which isn't going to change. Um, but certainly the music, I think the first album was a little bit more organic. Um, the second album was very electronic. Um, and then I've kind of mixed those up a, bit, a little bit recently from the new one. 
Yeah, so you came out with the album Popcorn Storm. How did you get the name? Uh, how did you get the name for that? Um, it was I was searching around for a name. I had a, a working title, and um, but then a friend of mine, his daughter, said one day, "Oh, Popcorn Storm," um, and he told me this, and I said, "Oh, that's such a good name. Shall we use it?" Um, and uh, he says, "Well, I'll go and ask her. She's only about five. And she was cool. <laughs> she said, "Yeah." Um, but we did do a little bit of uh, checking just to make sure it hadn't been used, or it wasn't like a kiddies TV show or anything like that. And it seemed uh, it didn't say it was just a random thing that this girl Umi um, had said. And we thought that's that's great. So I, I used it. Now. When you went into the studio for this, and once again, you did it at your home studio, which I think is so cool. I talked to a lot of musical guests who they had a home studio. To me, that's like the coolest thing. It's like, damn, you know. But uh, so when you went in, what was your goal for this album? Were you, uh, you going to try to, you know, what, I mean, what, what did you want from this album? coordinate the songs on the album? How do you put them in order? Uh, I usually do that quite early as I'm writing the album, so I think, oh, that'd be great it's an intro track. That's more of a mid-section, the mid-album track, and then I'll have a banger at the end. Um, and then I'll listen to the whole other thing, kind of work the tempos out a little bit, what is going to work, is it flowing um, dynamic-wise, is that going to work after that one? Um, so I do think about it a lot. I did think at one point of getting someone else to, to order it for me, like, you know, get a different set of ears on it, but then I, I didn't. <laughs> I made it a little bit of a control freak, I don't know. Well, if you go to your website, you have a video for Rise, you um, made you made the video back in the day for unbelievable. What has uh, been the different in process of videos? Because as you know now, I mean, and you you were in the MTV generation when it was taking off. What is yeah. the difference now in videos? How do videos play now? Do you think EMF would have been as big as they were if it wasn't for MTV? No, I think MTV was a, a groundbreaker, really, wasn't it? And it was at the time in the music industry when there was lots of money being flying around and lots of money being generated. Um, I mean, Unbelievable Video is not a big budget video by any means, but it, it still probably costs, you know, 80 grand or something, which these days is absolutely unheard of. You know, I think when we did the Unbelievable Video, we had like six cameras, a whole team of, a whole crew, and it took all day, um, you know, working on film rather than digital formats. Um, it was expensive. Um, and these days, it's not. <laughs> well, your video, well, on your website, you have a picture of a, you're a rabbit, and then in your video, you're dressed like a rabbit. Where, where, where's the rabbit theme come from? Um, that's, again, just organically happened. I had, uh, I've got a really good friend who's a great designer who does the sleeves. He's done the last three album sleeves. Um, he, I give him full range. I just say, what can you come up with? What are you thinking? Um, he's such a great designer. I don't really have, I don't want to have the input on that because I think, you know, that's, he's really talented with it. So he came back with these images of the bunny and I was thinking, right, okay, so how can we use that, you know, a bit of, um, a bit of branding with it? Not that I'm a businessman in any way, it means. Um, but then I was thinking, well, we need like a video. Um, 
we haven't really got a budget. Uh, <laughs> and I had a, an old friend get in touch, a guy who'd lived in LA for many years, he'd just come back to the UK, shot an AMS video many years ago. Um, and he came back and he says, well, let's, let's just go out into the Yorkshire Dales and just film. And I says, well, that's really good. Can I wear a bunny suit? And he went, perfect. So we all, so we, I just went to a local high shop, got a bunny suit, realised that we couldn't do any of the lip syncing with the, the bunny hat head on. So we had to kind of pull the, the head up a little bit and improvise a little bit, um, pick some locations. And, uh, yeah, the bunny thing's kind of stuck for this album. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's good. So I like the image of the bunny. Now... How do you feel about this album? What are your thoughts? Are you very happy with it? Uh, I mean, do you feel like you've grown as an artist? Or what are your feelings about it? Um, I am very chuffed with it. I think it sounds really, really good. I think it's um, definitely my best by far. Um, I've had loads of feedback from people saying, you know, you've, you've come on, you've come on. It's amazing how long it's taken me to actually develop <laughs> and get to get to this point of actually making records. I'm just thinking, wow, this is really good. Um, it's it's tricky because I haven't got any outside influences, and you know, that I, I would love to be able to go into a beautiful studio and record beautiful vocals and get amazing brass sections in and all strings and things like this. But I've got to kind of work within my limits a little bit, and I think I think I've kind of done what I've needed to do, and I am I am really happy with it. And I, and I kind of did think it was going to be my final album. I had it in my head. I'll just do the trilogy. And then I'll go off and do something else, just think of something else musically, whether work with someone else or, you know, maybe do some EMF stuff or, um, but already I've, I've kind of started writing another album. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to say, I mean, you know, and the thing is for you, you know, you, you see some people who take, takes years between albums, especially when they're coming from a big oh. band. I mean, you, you recorded your, your solo albums later in your career, but you've kicked out three and like, four or five years, how, I mean, how is it something that you can walk away from when you've already started working on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, they are coming thick and fast at the moment. I'm definitely on a bit of a creative streak. I think I'm in a good place in my head for doing this sort of stuff. I've, um, I've, I'm getting older. I'm getting a bit more disciplined. Um, I've got a family now. Um, I'm not going out and partying so much. The fog has lifted a little bit, which is uh, quite nice. I mean, you can kind of get sort of dragged away from your tranquility and outside influences stopping you being creative. But I think I've kind of just, I've got a little bit more focused. Now, will you go and tour with this album or, or a solo thing or what? Um, I have got a little bit of a solo outfit together um, and we are planning on doing some gigs. We've got one gig at a festival in the UK in August. Um, there's another festival called Shine Festival, which is quite a big one in the UK. Um, they have like lots of 90s bands and stuff. It's really cool. Um, I'm a little bit dubious about going out and just playing for the sake of it because I, on the first album I did go out and do quite a few shows and it was a little, it was quite hard work, it was a bit disheartening because the, the crowds were quite small, um, which is not a problem, but it's, you know, it's a lot of effort doing live shows, so I think I'm going to think about it a little bit more this time and just do events, festivals and stuff. Now, I was, as I was doing my research, I looked at an article. Now, you're also now a teacher? I am. I'm a school teacher. Now, how did that happen? Did you, I mean, when did you, did, I guess you have to get a degree for it, but how did that happen? Because that's amazing, you know, you've played these giant stadiums, and it's something that yeah. we need teachers. I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> well, I moved out of London. I moved to the countryside. I did envisage retiring, um, but I wasn't that old at the time. Um, I went and helped out at some urban art centre where people were DJing and producing, and I kind of thought, well, this looks really good fun. So I, I did actually go off and do a degree, um, and then they, they let me do a teaching degree. Usually 
didn't have to have a degree in your specialism, um, but because I'd, I'd had a past history of being a professional musician, they let me do my degree, a teaching degree. I got that, and then I went, I got a job. I just went and got a normal secondary school job, um, and that's what I do now, and I, I, I really like it. Well, you know, it's funny when you think about when you went to the job, you know, you had, I guess you had to have a resume. I mean, what do you... What do you put on the resume? You know, pop star? I mean, what, it's like one of those things. They must think, what the hell's going on? They must think, this guy's playing a joke on us. Well, yeah, I mean, thankfully, the job I've got now, they didn't ask for an interview or a CV or anything. They kind of knew who I was. Um, and this, the school I work in now, I've worked in for the last 10 years. If I did have to go for another job interview, or because I, I haven't, I've never done a job interview in my life or anything, right. so... <laughs> Now, you teach music? I do teach music, yeah, I do. Um, I forget that sometimes because it's, it's kind of a strange role because I work in a big secondary school um, and I also take on lessons. Um, sometimes you get these things called cover lessons. If there's members of the staff off, you'll go and cover their lessons. So I have been known to teach Spanish, German, geography, history, maths. I've kind of, I've, I've, I've kind of just all, as secondary, the secondary school teacher is kind of, you know, just works around different subjects. Now, when you teach music, though, is there any, mm. do you, let's say you're teaching it, do you see the talent in the kids? Are there some kids that you go, man, that, that he's got, or he, he or she has talent? Yeah, I must admit, though, I mean, it's, it, 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 it could be quite thin on the ground. I mean, in the 10 years I've been teaching, I've had a couple of students where I thought they've really got something. If they could just be nurtured, um, they could really go somewhere. And they have actually gone off to, like, music universities and things like that. Um, but it's a different, it's a strange culture these days. It's music, music's different to when we were young. It was... The kids don't really have the passion. They have the passion that they want to be famous, but they don't really have the passion where they want to be, you know, musically successful, if you know what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I, I noticed that too. Even in, like when I lived in L.A. in Hollywood, you know, yeah. the, a lot yeah. of the actors, they really studied the craft. They wanted to be an actor. And now, because with digital and everything... You can just be a good, really good-looking person, and you really don't have to act that well because they can cut it, splice it, and cut it and splice it. So it's changed a lot. I'm guessing yep. music has changed too. Yeah, totally. It seems like that. I mean, we are saturated over here with talent, TV talent shows, and people think that is the route to being a pop star or rock star, which it can be, but it isn't like you know when I was at school, I used to spend every weekend in a dirty, you know, basement with my guitar, playing for hours and hours on end, and we learned our craft like that. We wouldn't, didn't, we just, you know, I mean, we were still lucky that we kind of got something out of it, but today people think it's just going to be handed to them, and, you know, they deserve this success, if only they can be recognized for just singing one song on a TV show, so I might be a bit cynical, actually, but that's, it just seems different. Now, do you remember, this is something I have to ask because I ask my guests a lot. Do you remember the first time you heard uh, Unbelievable on the radio or one of your songs? Do you remember where you were? I don't know. I don't remember it at all. I, I remember the first TV appearance because we were on a show called Jukebox Jewelry, which it was a show where they had a panel of people and they discussed uh, new releases. Uh, and then uh, every week they would discuss a release, but then they'd have a special guest hiding in the background doing their record they're talking about. They didn't really know what band it was on. And we were on the show, and it was our first TV appearance. And uh, I remember Robert Smith was on the panel, and he, uh, he I think he said some quite nice things about EMF. I can't remember, but I always remember that because when I was a kid, I just loved The Cure. Um, and then to finally meet people like this, it was amazing. You know, I want to thank you for taking the time today. Now, Popcorn Storm is available to order now, right? It is, yeah. I mean, it's um, we've done a CD release, which 
is available through James Atkin Music. Uh, we are, there is a digital release coming, I think it's the first week of July, second, first, second week of July, where it'll be available on iTunes and Spotify and all the digital platforms. But the music is out there if people want to have a listen. And your website is, well, there's also jamesatkin.org.uk. Okay, you have the video yeah. up there. Yeah, there's some videos there, some links and some information. And yeah, so people could go and check it out. They, you know, I, 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 I hope people like it. And now you also, you're on Twitter. Is that at James Atkin Music? It is, yeah. Well, I want to I want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, people, please go check out his website. Check out him on Twitter. Listen to his music. It's good. You know, you got 40... 45 minutes, come on, what are you going to do in 45 minutes? You're not going to do anything, so listen to something good. Be productive instead of sitting on your ass. Anyway, so people, go check out James. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. I have over 730 episodes. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. I'm on Instagram at coopertalk1. I'm on Twitter at coopertalk. So remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.